Now hear this. Now hear this. Hi, I'm Fred Plink. I'm the Director of Marketing for the Red Oak Victory, and I want to welcome you back to Episode 3 of Now Hear This. If you're enjoying these episodes, please click the like button, which is right down below the screen. And if you want to see more of the episodes as they come out, be sure to click the subscribe button. Today's episode, we're going to talk about the working uniforms of the United States Navy sailor in World War II. At the start of the war, and actually in the years preceding the war, the common working uniform for the man who was on a shore station or who was working above decks on a ship was the undress blue uniform, which is what I'm wearing today. The undress blue uniform differs from the dress blue in that there are no cuffs, so there are no stripes on the cuffs, and there are no stripes on the collar flap. The sleeve insignia that are worn on the undress blue uniform are the same as those worn on the dress blue. So we have a rating badge, other qualification badges if the sailor has earned them, and service stripes, each stripe indicating a four-year enlistment. The undress blue uniform could be worn with a neckerchief, just as the dress blue uniform is, um, and mainly that would be seen in shore stations. On board ship, using the neckerchief or wearing the neckerchief could be dangerous because it could get uh, caught up in machinery. So this would probably be a more typical look for a shipboard sailor. Now there are two variations of the undress blue uniform. What I'm wearing is called undress blue B, as in boy. Undress B consisted of the dress blue uniform, blue wool trousers, blue wool jumper, and the white cotton hat. What was effectively, uh, sorry, what was um, uh, affectionately known as the Dixie Cup hat. It, in official terms, is called the white hat. The undress blue A uniform consisted of the same exact jumper and trousers, but with this blue wool flat hat. The blue wool flat hat in various forms had been a part of the U.S. Navy sailor's kit since the 1830s. It was a popular hat for a couple of reasons. One, it was for cold climates, it was a lot warmer than the, than the white cotton uh, white hat, and it was easy to care for. You simply folded it flat, and you were instructed when you were issued with this to keep the box to keep it in, which was a flat box. But even if you didn't have the box, you could simply take the flat hat and put it under your mattress, and it would stay perfectly unwrinkled and, and looking good, looking squared away. This is the undress white uniform. I bet that was pretty easy to figure out because the undress blue uniform is blue in color, the undress white uniform is white in color. After 1941, this was the only white uniform which was issued to uh, sailors in the United States Navy. Now all of these uniforms, the undress blue and the undress white, were issued only to sailors who were first class petty officers and below. Chief petty officers wore a uniform which was very similar to that of naval officers and quite different from that of the other enlisted personnel. The undress white uniform, identical to the undress blue except that it's made in white cotton. It has no stripes on the sleeves or on the collar and all of the sleeve insignia that are worn on a dress uniform are also worn on the undress white uniform. The undress white uniform, though, also doubled as the dress white uniform after January of 1941. So we'd add ribbons, any qualification badges that were appropriate to be worn over the pocket, and this uniform would serve as a liberty uniform, a shore uniform, a dress uniform for ceremonies, and so on. Another option for the undress white uniform uh, as a working uniform was to dispense with the jumper top entirely and wear just the white trousers 
with the white t-shirt for exceptionally hot days. And you often see this in uh, World War II pictures from the Pacific Theater where all the sailors are lining the rail of the ship when it's coming into port or departing for port and you see them wearing just t-shirts and not, not wearing the, um, the white jumper. The white jumper could also be worn and in fact had to be uh, if you were wearing it as a dress uniform, it had to be worn with the neckerchief. Another variation for the undress blue uniform was to include the blue wool jersey, which was uh, the jersey is just a, the Navy's name for a sweater. It's a blue turtleneck sweater worn underneath the jumper. And in addition to that, I've added the watch cap, which is also a knit blue uh, watch cap that matches the jersey. This is a good combination for slightly cool weather, for wind, uh, if you're working out on the open decks. Before World War II, your sailor that was working in conditions where he's more likely to get his uniform soiled would wear the dungaree uniform, which consisted of the blue denim jeans, the blue chambray shirt, and the white cotton hat, of which the entire uniform was made of cotton. It was easily laundered and, and cared for. When the uniform was soiled beyond wear or tear, it could easily be discarded and replaced. However, this uniform was used only below decks and above decks, which a sailor could be seen from other crew members or passing by ships. He would be wearing the uniform of the day either the undressed blues or the working whites. There were 300,000 enlisted personnel in the U.S. Navy on December 7, 1941. After the war started, that number grew like gangbusters. At peak count, there were 3,800,000 enlisted personnel in the Navy in World War II. <clears throat> That's more than a 12-fold increase. Manufacturing and caring for undress uniforms would have been prohibitively expensive. The blue undress uniform, for example, was made of a wool kersey material that needed to be dry cleaned and both the blue and white uniforms needed to be precisely pressed according to regulations. So, shortly after the war started, the Navy adopted the dungaree uniform, which was easy to care for, for all shipboard roles, enlisted roles, and many shore station roles. Even chief petty officers and some officers, especially on subs and PT boats, adopted the dungarees as their working uniform. The dungaree uniform also came with a jumper top that was made out of denim that was the same denim that was used for the trousers. This jumper top could be worn either with the, the dungaree shirt, the chambray shirt I should say, or with the t-shirt by itself and it served essentially as a light jacket uh, for use on slightly cooler days for the working uniform. The footwear used with the dungaree uniform varied depending on the sailor's assignment and also personal preference and as the war went on uh, both of those things changed. The standard footwear for the dungaree uniform would be the ankle boot, the black ankle boot that was issued to all sailors uh, in the United States Navy. Another option was to wear the Oxford shoe which was typically worn with the dress uniform, but a lot of sailors opted to wear that Oxford shoe with their working uniform as well. A third option was the canvas deck shoe. If you were working in an area where it was likely that, uh, that you would be uh, in a slippery environment, the canvas deck shoe was the ideal shoe to wear. They could get wet, they'd dry out quickly, and they had uh, a sole designed to uh, hold well on a wet deck. These, interestingly, were patented and sold to the Navy by Sperry, the same company that nowadays makes the Sperry Topsider uh, deck shoes that we're all familiar with. Another option that came up later in the war was the N1 boot. 
The N1 Navy boot was exactly the same as the famous U.S. Marine Corps boondockers boot and used by the Marines as their, as their combat shoe. It was intended, it was issued to the Navy and intended for use on shore, but it turns out a lot of sailors who were in, the, uh, in aviation or in the amphibious corps liked the uh, rough out uh, version of the, the, the boondocker boot, the N1 boot. As you can imagine, the white hat being worn with the dungaree working uniform would quickly become soiled and unsightly. Grease, particularly if you're working in the engine room, you could pick up grease and oil, sweat stains. It could look pretty awful in a short period of time. And so in 1943, the Navy authorized dyeing the white hat various colors. The most common was dark blue, such as the one that, that I'm wearing. But other colors were used as well, and particularly on aircraft carriers where the color of uh, both the jersey and a hat worn by personnel could uh, designate what their job was on the flight deck. The trousers of the dungaree uniform were made extremely baggy. The World War II trousers, in fact, were not bell bottoms. They were straight leg and were made with simply a very wide leg. Some sailors did have their dungaree trousers and in fact all of their uniform trousers tailored to have an extreme bell bottom, but the dungarees were not, uh, did not come from the factory with the bell bottom leg. The primary purpose of the wide leg trousers was so they could be easily rolled up even up as far as above the knee for deck work such as swabbing or holy stoning that could get the bottom of the trousers wet or dirty. There is also some belief that the trousers were designed this way to allow them to be easily taken off over your boots, the legs tied off, and air trapped inside for use as an emergency flotation device. I'm skeptical about this, primarily because I've never seen a single account by any sailor who used them this way in an actual sinking. Imagine being in ocean swells, enemy fire coming in, perhaps burning oil on the water, and you're trying to get your pants off to make a flotation device. Much more likely that if you don't have your Kapok vest on, you'll look for floating debris or attempt to hang on to a lifeboat if they've been deployed. On the other hand, our friend and colleague Ryan Szymanski at Battleship New Jersey did jump in the pool to test this idea and he was successful with it. You can find a link to his video in the description below. The ship's commanding officer set the tone for how the dungaree uniform could be worn. Some captains were pretty lax about the regulations, and many sailors got away with expressing their individual, shall we say, style, including the use of civilian clothing elements. Particularly in the tropical heat of the Pacific Theater, there was a great deal of flexibility on most ships about how such things as hats were worn, shirt tails tucked in or not, shirts buttoned or unbuttoned, sleeves cut off, or even no shirt at all. For an interesting vignette about this, see the movie The Cane Mutiny, in which a very strict regular Navy captain takes over from a reserve captain who'd been fairly easygoing about uniform discipline. Actors Lee Marvin and Claude Aikens, nicknamed Meatball and Horrible, are the biggest slobs you can imagine, and inevitably, they run afoul of the very much by the book Captain Queeg. Thank you for watching this episode of Now Hear This. I hope you learned a little something about Navy working uniforms of World War II. If you have any questions or comments, please put them in the comments section below. And if you enjoyed this video, give us a thumbs up like and subscribe to the Red Oak Victory YouTube channel so that you can see future editions of Now Hear This.